So, you ready to go? Sure. Wolfgang Wild, welcome to Sweden and Gothenburg. Thank you. And uh, you have a child who desired to go back in time. And uh, you are the creator of Retronaut, and you are going to tell us more about it now. Welcome, and you have 20 minutes. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. I don't work in a museum or an archive. I'm not trained as a curator, and I'm not responsible for any digital content at all. That's the, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> but it's true. When I was a child, I had this desire. It was my, my main desire was to go back in time. I was fascinated by not so much the past, but the idea that there was another version of now or n other versions of now that were, in my mind, out there. And I couldn't get there. And uh, this was fascinating to me as another planet or another country. Uh, and it seemed to me like an oversight that I couldn't actually go there. It was deeply frustrating to me, as though uh, it was a foreign country and I'd lost my passport. And uh, I went into my adult life and that didn't really lead that childhood desire to an obvious career opportunity. My wife is a fellow of Oxford University and her subject is translation of the Psalms from Latin into medieval English by female mystic writers. <laughs> and obviously, she could go anywhere with that. But for me, I didn't have, I didn't have that sort of thing. I didn't have a thing that I could do anything with and I, I felt a bit of a, a disappointment to myself. I sort of drifted through life and uh, never really seemed to amount to very much and I would read careers books again and again and one time I was reading one of these careers books in my early 30s and the question was, this is a great question by the way, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And I was frustrated and I threw the book aside and I said, well it, it honestly just doesn't apply to me. And this was a new thought to me and I thought, what do I mean by that? Then? And I said to myself, well, because what I want to do, really, you can't do. What I really would do, if I knew I couldn't fail, I'd go back in time, and you can't do that. And, uh, yeah, I sound slightly insane at this point, a voice inside me said, <laughs> exactly, now we're getting somewhere. Your thing is not to go back in time. Your thing is, if you're someone who wants to go back in time and you can't, what do you do? And I thought, oh, that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, okay. And now, at this point, I started to remember all these experiences that I'd had uh, through the years of disappointment and failure and disappointing my mother-in-law and so on. And I'd, in my mind, I'd collected pictures that I'd seen, places that I'd been, phrases that I'd heard, that for me had a strange effect. They had the effect of dissolving time. Like uh, if, on my ring, if, if it's, I can put polish and it dissolves away the tarnish. These were things that dissolved away the tarnish of time and sort of uh, projected me right into another moment in time. And uh, it's very hard to explain, but it's easy to show you. So this is one of these pictures. Um, actually, this is not one of the pictures, but it will be in a moment. You may have seen this picture before. It, it, it's quite well known. It was taken in 1909 in Russia by a man called Prokudin Gorsky. And uh, we look at this picture and it looks like the past. And most of the pictures that we see of the past, they look like the past and they fit. We, we each have a map in our heads of time. And when we see pictures and material that fits with our map, it's okay. We say, yes, that looks like the past. So this is in black and white. They look very stilted, it's clearly not today. It says 1909, that's fine. But this is a picture that I've um, changed because originally it was in color. So this isn't color that I or someone else has added. Prokudin Gorsky invented a color camera uh, and he never commercialized it. He only had this one camera, but the Tsar paid for him to travel across the Russian Empire photographing it in full color. And when we see it in color, the grass and the wood and, and the girl's skin, it doesn't look like the past. It looks like, we know it's the past, it says 1909, but it looks, the color looks like now. 
but it's a different now. And when I saw pictures like this, my brain did a little double take. It would say, so it's 1909, it doesn't look like 1909. I wasn't thinking this, but this is what was happening inside. And then what would happen? A little hole was torn in my map of time. And this, for me, was the closest experience I'd got to time travel. Now, this is all very nice and interesting, and you're thinking, oh, this is quite a sweet little story. What on earth is the point of all this? It turns out, this is the bit that would probably be interesting to you, I discovered a method for making historic material go viral. And I shall share my secret formula, and it is a formula, with you at the end of the presentation. So that, that's, the kind of, that's the reason, apart from me just telling you about my childhood traumas. So, uh, I called it Retronaut. I'd spent a lot of time uh, in um, bands, in, in, and this uh, was an influence on me. And, um, because I, once I'd started collecting these pictures, I was showing them to friends, and one of them said, you should start a blog, and I did. And this was what I called it. And I thought, I wonder if I can make... I was interested in, could I make history a bit feel like, to me, what a band feels like. So I came up with a name that I thought was a bit like a band and the logo and everything. And I started to share these pictures. This was one of the first pictures that I shared. In fact, this was... So I started it at the beginning of uh, 2010, in January 2010. And uh, it was just a WordPress blog. I, for two or three weeks, there were two visitors, me and my mother. <laughs> and uh, between us, we, we had about two or three hundred hits a day. Just the two of us, you know, clicking on it. And uh, then on January the 28th, I posted a set of pictures of which this was one. This is Shaftesbury Avenue in Piccadilly Circus in London. And I looked at the statistics on the blog, and it was 30,000 hits. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, my mother's really been clicking. With the... <laughs> but, but it turned out this had gone viral. And this carried on. So I carried on posting pictures every day that, for me, had this time travel effect. But it built up an audience. Uh, Retronaut's got a, a reasonable social following now. Um, and I kept it going just like that um, until 2014, when I was approached by an American-based site called Mashable, some of you may know. And they said, we currently don't have anything really to do with history, but we like what you're doing with Retronaut. Uh, could we license you? and Retronaut, and I had some helpers working with me at this time, and you do your curation um, on Mashable. And I did. One of my friends said to me, so I basically made myself into a piece of intellectual property, which is what I did. And I now have, this sounds absurd, I have a full-time under-Retronaut, a Sue Retronaut, in uh, um, New York, who does most of the curation now, and I, I merely um, uh, glance, you know, in a very <laughs> lounging way. He was like, yes, very good, carry on. <laughs> this is, uh, on, on Mashable, it used to say history, it now says retronaut. So it's kind of a double-edged ego sword. On the one hand, I've rebranded all of history. On the other hand, on my tombstone, it will say, he changed a drop-down menu. That would be it. So this is, uh, this is a Retronaut on Mashable, and we post two or three posts a day um, of content that, in some sense to me, uh, doesn't fit with the way I imagine the past. But the, the strange thing, is, well, I'll show you the strange thing in a moment. I work with quite a lot of museums and archives. This was with the National Museums of Scotland. They had an exhibition on uh, crinolines. So if any of you would like to collaborate, uh, it's entirely free of charge, um, that would be great. But um, this was um, this is where one of the curious parts. Of it. Here's another one of Prudent Gorski's pictures. This was the first post that I posted in the first week that I was on Mashable. And what I did, I took down all the pictures that were on Retronaut.com because I cobbled them together from various public domain. Uh, sources. I was always very careful to respect copyright, but when I went to Mashable, they said, oh, here's the keys to Getty, go and use whatever you want. So suddenly I could use these great big pictures. So I, I took everything down from Retronaut.com and started it again. And I reposted this, these um, Russian pictures uh, in the first week. And um, on, 
October the 1st, 2014, that post was responsible for this amount of Mashable's entire traffic. Uh, I mention this because, and it's carried on doing very well, because sometimes we think of old photographs and archive photographs as not cool or viral, but they're very viral. And in fact, so this is, this is the entire Mashable site from July 2015 to 2016, and this is the top 10 posts on it. And as you can see, five of them are retronal, and the time on site is a lot longer than, than everything else. Um, admittedly, I am competing with scary street view, but uh, it, you know, it's great that culture can take that on. So there's Retronaut being the, the top curator there. I did an exhibition in Northumberland. Uh, I was guest curator at their uh, museums and archives for a year, and that culminated in a, an exhibition of uh, a physical exhibition of 25 pictures. So I went from digital to physical, and then I did that um, amazingly in New York. Uh, on Fifth Avenue, uh, working with an exhibition company there, did a, a, a physical exhibition of very, very big panoramic pictures of, of New York from the turn of the century, which is there. I did a book with National Geographic, uh, which didn't sell any copies. Um, I did another one that also didn't uh, with another publisher. Um, I think it was cool, but uh, in Britain we had these ladybird books for grown-ups, and so... I, I was completely slaughtered by them, and this one too. Uh, and I did a range of cards, and they didn't sell either. So I've done a sort of various experiments. So my latest one, is my latest one, which I've, I'm a little bit more optimistic about, is this book, uh, which is coming out in uh, September. And for this one, uh, I, I have a main collaborator, Jordan, and he is, I believe, the best colorizer of images in the world. Now, many of us don't uh, rate colorized images because lots of the ones that we've seen are not very good, and I, I agree, most of them are not very good. But Jordan's are especially good, and I thought this would make a really nice book. We've done 125 um, pictures that we've put into color. Uh, I'll show you some of those now. This is uh, that's the cover image. That's Wilbur Wright in 1902. This is uh, the Garment District in New York in 1928. Um, Jordan, the thing that makes Jordan's work special is the research that he does. He goes to the, the nth degree. I always say, if it had been me doing the colouring, I would have just said, yeah, it turned out all the hats were black. But, you know, he, he, he goes into that trouble. Uh, that's um, Central Park in New York in the 1930s when it was a Hooverville. Uh, it's a union family uh, in the 1860s in America. The frame is, that's the original color is the frame in the picture he's done. That's a portrait by Fred Holland Day uh, in the 1890s. Uh, this is the Chicago Theater in Chicago in 1948 by Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick was a photographer for Look Magazine before he was a film director. Uh, this Piccadilly in 1928. And uh, a bridge in Seattle. Uh, that's the original Alice. This is a page from the book. We used a crowdfunding platform for this book, so we thought, what would be some sets of images that we could put out there to raise the profile for that? So we did. Uh, we thought, oh, Ellis Island immigrants. So we put into color uh, around about 16 um, pictures of immigrants um, in the early 1900s. And we were able to get a lot of press for that. We had a nice piece in The Guardian about that. And we also did um, landmarks of the world under construction. This is Tower Bridge in London. And again, we got some um, really good press for that. Um, this is um, obviously Eiffel Tower under construction, and it was red when it was built. And uh, we were playing around with this and, and did this little thing here. Let's see if this works. More recent. So th these are some of the some some of the things I'm doing. But don't worry, I get onto the formula. Remember, uh, just recently I've been looking at illustration. That's been interesting to me for the first time, and in particular these. Uh, beautiful displays um, in vintage encyclopedias have been really interesting to me. So I'm sort of branching out from 
looking at these, I love that one, of fencing, <laughs> branching out a little bit from photography. <laughs> anyway, formula. Here's how you do it. Speed. Basically, um, well, after doing it on Mashable for a couple of years and it, uh, doing very well, the, the stats people at Mashable said, we've had a look at the statistics and the data of, of what you're posting and we can't really work out any reason why it's being successful. Uh, and I said, well, it's simply because I'm a genius. I'm sure. <laughs> And uh, they said, well, yes, we're aware of that. But, you know, apart from that, you know, it, it's not posts from the 1950s or the 1920s. It's not Russian posts. It's not color. It's, you know, there's no apparent theme. And I said, no, that's true. But, what, but that's because I'm using this formula. And the key part of that is disruption. And in summary, the less a picture it's hard to express without using negatives. The more a picture doesn't fit on people's map of time, the more viral it is. And I'll explain why that is. But I use this formula called speed. Um, so the first one is, um, I'm gonna skip over those slides. The first one is, sounds obvious, but sometimes, if, particularly for us working in museums and archives, it's less intuitive, which is that it needs to be something that you see. Um, sometimes, in the early days of Retronaut, people used to protest that I didn't put very much text with it and, and information and data. And, uh, and I always used the bare minimum. And I said, well, to me, the data is the, the, is the piece of content, is the image. Um, and I want to force people to get back in the habit of reading secondary, but mainly looking. And um, of course, there is always data to go with it. And in fact, now, that, that's more axiomatic than it was. So the, I describe it as the language, the currency of the internet is pictures. If you look at uh, status sharing on Facebook, the vast majority of it is accompanied by a photograph or a picture. So starting with the picture uh, is essential in my view. Oh yeah, here's this nice little stat about that. Most shared, liked, and commented posts uh, the vast majority of it is images. So if I would just, I mean, you probably do this anyway, but I learned to think of images as, as the currency. This is what I'm trading in online. Uh, it needs to be something that's positive. Doesn't, that doesn't have to mean a positive emotion in the way that uh, we think of happy or smiling, although that's helpful. But it needs to be a piece of content that is giving some kind of benefit to the viewer so that um, it's not something that you, as a, an archivist or a curator, think is important. Sometimes it might be, but it's what it. But it is from the point of view of the viewer. It has something to offer them that is useful. I, when I started Retronaut, one of the things that had interested me about museums and archives was: um, was I able to find material in museums and archives that could be of interest to people? who really didn't care about museums and archives, who you just thought they were boring and uninteresting and weren't interested in history. Because that seemed quite challenging to me. And because I was coming from the background of music, I used to think of it as hit singles. The bit that interested me was the very small three-minute hit single. Could I find the hit singles in archival content? Because if I could, then that would ex allow people to ex listen to the whole album and, and explore the archive. So when I'm looking at a picture for Retronaut, I'm subconsciously or consciously asking myself, why should someone care about this picture? What's the positive benefit to them? It needs to be something easy to get. What that means is, this is very easy to get, which is that, um, you know, it's a boy with a pig. Uh, yes, that's right. So it doesn't require any explanation. And the faster we are the material that we use communicates, uh, the, the faster, the easier it is. Now, this doesn't, doesn't have to mean dumb or stupid, because it can be um, profound. But um, what we want, I, I sometimes think of Retronaut as a bit like the shop window of a department store. And what I put in the shop window needs to be stuff that will stop you in, as you're walking past and think, oh, I like that. And then I might go into the shop and, and, and browse around and look more deeply. 
um, sometimes museums and archives digitally can be like a, a shop window where there's nothing to see or everything's in boxes. So that, that was the bit that interested me. Uh, there's a horrible cliche which is when we care, we share. But leaving that aside, I'm looking for something that has an emotive quality that makes me feel something. Uh, that doesn't always have to be happy. So this is a picture of uh, immigrants to Ellis Island again. And um, it's unusual in as much as it's got this very strong tiered arrangement and they have these particularly stark expressions on their face. So it's a very emotive picture. Um, but when I've, when, once I've got these qualities together, then I'm, I'm starting to have something that will be viral. But the most important one is disruptive. And this is this quality at the beginning. I kind of imagine what's everyone's map of time like, and then I look for the things that don't fit, and the, the, the stronger that is, the more viral it, it will be, and it, it routinely is the case. So this set of pictures, I was guest curator at Europeana uh, for six months, and this came from their collection, and it is pictures, um, I think, from Hungary, of before and after nose jobs from the 1930s. Um, so you can see the, the plastic surgery correction that has gone there. And for most of us, a nose job is something from Beverly Hills, perhaps in the 1970s and 1980s. We're not used to seeing it um, at this time, and we're not used to seeing before and after pictures uh, in this particular way. And also, of course, there are the uh, racial connotations from that time. And when I shared this on Retronaut, uh, it didn't have any views on Europeana, but as a result, uh, plastic surgery became the number one search term that year. And uh, referring, coming back to our friend, the boy with the pig, uh, this was another image that I shared from Europeana. Um, I, I don't know why it's disruptive, actually. Because I, I, normally I, it's, we sort of say, hey, you know London in the 1920s, 40s, yes, well, look at this colour picture. But I can't really say that with this. You know boys with pigs? <laughs> we say, yes. But there's something about it that's very disruptive. I do know that his father owned a farm and was asking his son to get on the pig, and he didn't want to. So that was going on. But anyway, I picked this one, and it had no views at all on Europeana. And I shared it, put it in the shop window, if you like, and it um, got used in various memes. and um, became the most shared image on Europeana. So um, clearly I am a genius, but also this is a formula that I've now given, I've given you my magic beans. You can, get, you can go and use this uh, however you want and, and it will work. This is basically how to make old, old pictures go viral. Um, and um, that's me, that's what I've been doing with, with no pictures at all. Um, I just wanted to leave you with one other picture, which is an early one that I shared on Retronaut. This is a picture that is known as um, an example of the hidden mother. And this was that in the uh, pre-1890s, pre which was when um, exposure time became much, much faster, to take a photograph of a child um, was difficult because they would wriggle about. But often parents wanted their child just as a, as a portrait in a locket. So the photographer would ask the mother to sit under a cloth like this and then would later crop out the uh, picture of the child. And as you can see, for the child, it was a lovely uh, experience. <laughs> um, now, my wife, uh, I mentioned her before, she um, very much dedicated to... Uh, research and taking, th you know, really going into detail about a subject. So she um, asked me to recreate this, uh, which I did. <laughs> so that's me, uh, the hidden father, I guess. Uh, and I thought I would just, you know, uh, leave that with you to show that I, I, I do believe in what I'm saying. But the most curious thing about this photograph is not that I'm sitting under a cloth. It's that my son Zebedee is doing that, <laughs> which I have no idea why. Um, 
And perhaps in a hundred years' time, that would be a retronautic picture because it won't fit on anyone's map of time. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, very inspiring. Thank you. Any questions? My favourite is actually Bill Bailey. <laughs> you reminded me of Mind you of Bill Bailey? <laughs> yes. Hopefully <laughs> much, much better looking. <laughs> you don't have to answer that. It's not a very Swedish question, is it? It could be. Someone has their hand up. Yes. Yes, um, thank you. Fascinating um, presentation. And I was wondering, this, this thing about disruption, is that, is that always about time? Or is it about something else? I mean, people's preconceptions of what a certain category of person or so would do. Could well, you please repeat the question? Yes, so uh, the gentleman said, is disruption always about time or can it be about um, another category, about a person or, or so on and so forth? Uh, disruption is certainly a very powerful force for, um, uh, for new creativity. The way that I was using it was I was thinking, I had this crazy idea, could I look at any object in a museum or hundreds of thousands of images that are all archive images, which therefore, what, what's the commonality between all of them and how can I pick the ones that are going to have an effect? And when it comes to museum objects, um, or archival material, it is time. That is the, co that is the common uh, taxonomy, that everything that is not contemporary and, and current has this uh, quality all the way through it of time. And I thought, actually, maybe I could apply that. Maybe if I look at that one um, matrix and I say, right, so all these pictures come from different points in time. So the most disruptive to my way of thinking of time, should that should apply, and it turns out that that does work. So I was just using it in that sense. But what it does mean, for example, um, just off the top of my head, Marilyn Monroe, we all imagine, we knew very famous pictures of Marilyn Monroe we can think of, and those wouldn't, wouldn't be very disruptive. They may be popular, and, but what I would be looking for is there's some great pictures of her um, reading Ulysses. Uh, by James Joyce, so those would, those would work very well. And they're dis they belong to time, but they're disruptive of our version of Marilyn Monroe in time. Any other questions? Okay. But what are your plans now? Of course, now you shared your formula, <laughs> and we, are, we have access to pictures. So you have a new plan for something else? Or? <laughs> Well, I, as I say, I'm very interested in illustration at the moment. And also, the other thing that's interesting me is building the shop. Not, not the actual shop, but the, the department store behind Retronaut. So I can find these pictures that I put in on Mashable and they're very viral. But what about all the other pictures that I, that I don't do with that? Is there a way of working more deeply with a whole collection uh, to find new ways of allowing people to explore those? So that's what I'm looking at now. Uh, for the rest of the day, I'm here. Okay. So. Thank you. And this is a gift given oh. to the United Nations for kids uh, escaping war and uh, trying to help them uh, learn how to read and write. So thank you. Great. And we are now heading for lunch. And uh, let's end this with a big applause again, I think. Thank you.